The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. My baby dolls, we are back again. Another episode of Genesis. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz. And let me tell you, we got a great show coming up today. we got Brandon Islieb on the show, and he has this fascinating book uh, that's been out since the beginning of the year from McFarland uh, Publishing Company, Playing for a Winner, How Baseball Team Success Raises Players' Reputations. And we're going to be talking a lot about sabermetrics and a lot of uh, calculations and a lot of different categories that Brandon created, um, which really defines how a player's uh, ability to help his team, as well as being recognized uh, for reputation, and how all this is quantified and number crunching. So uh, this is an angle that I've never seen. A lot of other people haven't seen it. It's definitely New Age, just like my podcast name, The New Age in uh, Sports and Entertainment. So sit back, relax, and we're going to get to Brandon in probably about two minutes. But, of course, you are listening to, as always, the Comfortably Zone Radio Network with the Zigzag Man, Ralph Tycho. And, you know, we have great shows that are on the air. we got Bill Cachetis in Philadelphia with uh, Philadelphia Baseball Past, Present, Future. And, again, we're not only talking Phillies baseball, we're talking athletics baseball, we're talking Negro League baseball like the Philadelphia Stars, we're talking uh, women's baseball in Philadelphia. We have Eldon Ham out in Chicago doing the White Sox and Cubs past, present, and future. We got the Giants baseball, Yankee baseball, New York baseball. We got Mark and Mark in the midday, and that's Mark Littell and Mark Blythe. Now, if you don't know who Mark Littell was, he's the guy on Kansas City who gave up that home run to Chris Chambliss in the 1976 American League Championship Series and uh, propelled the Yankees to go into the World Series for the first time in 12 years. We got Peter Golenbach, for God's sakes. World-renowned author in Golenbach's University. And every Sunday night, him and Ralph and uh, Hal Bach and a few others uh, teach us the value of uh, the inside of baseball. And, of course, Peter's been on the inside of baseball since 1972 after he graduated law school. Didn't practice law a day in his life, but he wrote about 50 books since that time. So got to give the guy some credit, you know, Hal Bach. American uh, American Associated Press over here. He has been uh, with uh, Reader's, Reader's Digest and the, and the Associated Press since 1962. For God's sakes, the guy just turned 78 years old. He's on a show called Vintage Sports because Hal covered over 30 World Series and probably about you know 30, 35 Super Bowls. So a lot of entertainment on the network. A lot of entertainment. We're here for you. We're here for you to learn stuff. You're going to learn a lot of stuff today because this book is fascinating. Now, this is a book you can read from cover to cover uh, like I did. But what I think is it's a good reference book because it goes back to 1871. The chapters are built, uh, you know, in, in such a way to understand what the author's concepts of the calculations that he's trying to obtain here and how it applies not only to the current players and every year he updates his um, uh, stuff on uh, baseball spa, Spotlight Baseball, uh, and we'll get into his website as well. There's a nice Excel spreadsheet if you understand that stuff there. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, of the calculations, explanations. But this book is an important reference book, and I would suggest everyone, you know, the holidays are coming up. Before I even get Brendan on my show, you know, you go out and you get a book like this, you read it, and then you have the reference. And then if you understand the calculations and you continue on with uh, Brandon's blog, you get to learn more about reputation, momentum, and, of course, what Brandon calls the spotlight war. Well, we'll get into war. Why is war important? Uh, it's all coming up. But even before I bring Brandon out, you know, he is a legislation editor, and that's just great, you know, a legislation editor. He's also a crackpot like me, graduated law school, for God's sakes. Anyone who graduates something where you're doing the Socratic method of learning, you've got to have half a brain. And uh, for this, he's the editor for the city of Seattle. He maintains BaseballSpotlight.com, which I've mentioned, and has written about baseball for the hardball times and baseball perspective. He lives in Took I don't even know how to say this, Tukwiler, Washington. Without any further ado, welcome to the show, Brandon. Thank you so much, Ian. 
You know, I mean, anyone who goes to law school and actually survives the bar exam, you know, got to be a crackpot. I mean, you know, that just almost <laughs> killed me when I was when I was 25 years old. But you go even further here. You're into a realm like uh, I am, and before we even get here, your love of baseball started when you were eight years old. You, you know, I've listened to the other podcasts, like I told you. You got Topps cards, and for some reason, the back of those cards must have really mystified you. Stats galore. How'd you get your love for all these number crunchings and stuff like that for baseball? Well, yeah, as as you said, uh, just got handed these packs. I had gone to one baseball game in my life. That was uh, Fenway Park, August 26th, 1992. Frank Viola pitched a 10 and incomplete game, but I was too young to know that that was interesting or significant. But, uh, yeah, I just I got fascinated by everything on the back. There were so many numbers, and I just had to find out what they meant. And I, I knew a number of people who were kind enough to get me into Bill James at that age. The library had a lot of his books. This was 93, 94, so there was a lot of material of his that was kind of in the common parlance. But I just I steeped myself in it and then just kept it up from there. I just devoured everything I could find baseball wise and Bill James was an early part of not only my baseball learning but really my ability to think about what questions to ask how to come up with a concept just how to question life Bill James is a huge influence on me personally in loads of ways but obviously that has its most direct connection to baseball well again you know, for those who don't know, Bill James is, is the one who originally coined the phrase Sibin Metrics back in 1980. Of course, that's before you were born. And, and basically, a Sibin Metric is the search for objective knowledge about baseball. But let me ask you this question here. Sibin Metrics became big under uh, Billy Bean and the Oakland A's. Why do you think it's used? Probably, what is it used? Ninety-nine percent by all teams. They run the numbers and they get the. You know, this this goes on for not only college baseball, but who are you going to put in against a certain pitcher? They look at all these numbers. Do you think Sabre metrics should be uh, used as much as it is, as it is um, today? Because look, I mean, Oakland hasn't won a pennant uh, under Sabre metrics. People who use Sabre metrics, it's not foolproof. What's the deal with that? Well, I think what we're seeing, and it took it took a lot of years to get to this point, but I think sabermetrics has kind of come full circle in a lot of ways to where it's now being used with things like video data. We're getting so, so much better film, which I means film's been a part of the game for a really long time, but that we're now getting to where the various front office analytic types are very good at explaining and giving new types of information to the players and to the scouts and to the front office, other front office people. And really, I think just the parts that most easily translate, teams have more or less figured out what those are. So now it's being used at the level of, oh, maybe you should consider making this kind of swing adjustment. It's, it's now being used for stuff that really was the realm of scouting, and it's kind of a supplemental product now to all that scouting. So is it foolproof? No, because there are, number one, there are loads of teams doing it. Number two, players can change. It's, it's not predictive in that way, but now it's just another developed tool in everybody's arsenal as they try to figure out how to get an advantage on each other. Now, you took that concept, the concept of Sabre Metrics, and you wrote a book, which is very, I mean, the concepts themselves are easy if you actually think about it, but you wrote a book that has opened my eyes and anyone's eyes who reads this book. What were you trying to accomplish with this fascinating work? And look at the sources. I mean, I have to even read the source notes to understand what the heck you're talking about in some of these things. Well, the basic thing I wanted to do, and the, some of the core stats were about a half decade in the making, or at least a half decade in the tweaking. Uh, I wanted a way at, at base to rank uh, team, team spotlight sort of the size of their empire 
if, if you will. In other sports, particularly college sports, there are coaches' polls and things like this that are some kind of eyeball test of past performance and present performance. If a terrible team starts a college football season 4-0, it doesn't mean everyone is immediately paying attention to them. There's some sort of, I guess, lag time, you might say, as people go, is this team for real? Is it worth paying attention to this team versus a powerhouse that starts slow? We have these built-in assumptions that, you know, last year's winners that start slowly are still worth paying attention to. They're still going to be relevant. They're still going to figure it out. Whereas a team that was terrible last year, like the Twins, lost over 100 games, then actually made the playoffs. It takes a while for everyone to adjust their expectations. So I was trying to figure out, well, what is the baseline that drives that? Is there is there a way of stacking the teams against each other so we can kind of get at where everyone's sort of mentally ranked? And the basic thing I came up with is, well, it's tied to days spent in playoff contention, actual literal days, because if you're successful in a day, then there are storylines that people are going to be interested in. But it takes time to pass the teams in front of you. The, the you know, historically, often the Red Sox and the Yankees and the Dodgers, they have to stop making storylines of success for anyone to care about anyone else. And so, with that, I created. I created a statistic called momentum that is, at base, a measure of days spent in pending contention with some other adjustments for, for various things, to be able to track, well, okay, who's kind of the number one team that people think of, regardless of whether they have the most wins at any given point in time, who is everyone expecting to be the number one team at this point in time? Usually the person that pays enough money, but that's that's going out the window. The Yankees have shown that. Uh, the Dodgers, um, they're up there also. I, I don't know if the Dodgers are paying the luxury tax. I forget. Uh, but um, I think they, they are. Yeah, because I know the Yankees have cut payroll to a point where they don't have to pay the luxury tax. They got they got rid of all their stars last year. The Yankees. Okay, let's talk about the Yankees for a second. They got rid of all their stars and they're bringing all these kids and you know Cashman's like. Well, we're going to bring the youth movement in. How much did uh, Sabermetrics play a part in that? Well, as a as a Red Sox fan, I don't know as much about the Yankees' internals as some other people might, but certainly the Yankees are usually drafting in kind of a lower position than a lot of others, so it's not always true that the toolsy guys fall to them. And so... A lot of advanced analysis is really necessary on their end to gain an advantage from the draft that doesn't naturally fall to them. But some some of that is combined with good scouting as well. Aaron Judge was not nearly on everybody's radar the same way he was on the Yankees' radar. Yeah, I mean, and last year, Judge batted, I think, a dismal under 200, if I recall, 100. He batted 174, and no one expected this kind of season this year. But I, I want to go into two things. The, the math of perception is the, is the momentum, like you described um, uh, before. But let me add, how do you get this numbering system? Like, um, a team gains momentum at least two games over 500 and within three games of first place, within two games of the first wild card. Uh, and, of course, it says 2012 later, leading the second wild card. How do you gain momentum? Well, you gain momentum ba- basically by being by leading a playoff position or being within a series of it. The, the idea, as I conceive it, is that the way that baseball can hype teams is really the pre-series talk. You know, football, it's a lot easier. People just talk about the matchup for the entire week, and then there's one game. And I, I think a three-game series is the closest thing we've got. If there's, you know, say it's late September, and there are two teams that are playing each other, they're within three games of each other, so if the one sweeps, it creates a tie then we're going to talk about both teams. We're going to analyze both teams. We're going to write stories about both teams. 
And that shines a spotlight on both of them. And I think from that we can derive kind of generally that that's how we come to focus on teams. Their exploits are worth talking about. And really it's driven by first place. It's not driven by raw numbers of wins, because that can fluctuate from season to season. But at the baseline is there's always a first place. There's always someone angling for first place. Whoever's in first place kind of defines the storylines for everyone else. And that's right. Every year. I mean, I did a show back then, and uh, I'm sure you looked into it. Uh, I did a show uh, with Bill Kishanis, who's now on the, uh, on the uh, network, uh, about the 93 Philadelphia Phillies. You know, like you like you mentioned on other podcasts and stuff. Listen, they didn't win a World Series that year, and so you know they're not going to be their reputation, their their spotlight isn't going to be as high as those who had won the World Series that year. But yet they were able to bring, beat the Atlanta Braves and get the National League uh, pennant that year. Right, and, and the '93 was a very strange year for existing contending teams. The Pirates had won the division the year before, but they didn't have the money to keep Barry Bonds. They did keep Andy Van Slyke. That didn't work out. Doug Drabeck also left for the Houston Astros. A lot of their team got got gutted that year. Over in the AL, the AL was a mess. The AL East was very weird. The A's collapsed. One of my favorite statistics of the 93 A's, and yes, I do have a favorite statistic about the 93 A's that probably says something about me, but I think all their pitchers except Bobby Witt that threw at least 10 innings in 92 and 93, all their ERAs were over a run higher in 93. That's how badly that team collapsed. But the thing is, those teams came in with high expectations, and so – any of these last-place teams like the Phillies that suddenly find themselves in contention, the wider world of sports, the kind of team-watching thing, it just takes a while into a season to believe a nearly 100-loss team like the Phillies has suddenly turned around and is really going to be a first-place team. And so, yeah, they contended all year, but as far as my numbers have it, people were paying a lot less attention to their 97-win team than if one of the existing contenders had accomplished the same thing. And let me ask you this question. Now we're going to get to your uh, particular concepts here. Reputation. Yeah. we got productivity, time spotlight. We haven't, we haven't gotten to uh, the spotlight yet. Well, what's going on here with reputation and the productivity versus spotlight? I think it's – honestly, I think it's the basic kind of life formula that for people to recognize your work, you have to do something, and someone has to notice you doing it. Now, how many, how many someones, how prominent a someone, well, that factors in to how much your work as a person – is recognized. You can, you can, uh, well, a lot of the, sorry, stumbling over my words a little bit. One of the examples I use in the book is the difference between someone who puts out one hit single, but it goes to number one, versus someone, versus a band that's a little bit uh, less known, but tours constantly. They might sell the same number of albums over their lifetime, but a lot of random people who aren't into music are going to know that one-hit wonder better than that band who tours constantly. And that's, you know, the band who tours constantly is kind of the productivity side of that equation, and the one-hit wonder is the spotlight side of that equation. You can still get to kind of equivalent reputations, equivalent name recognition, but there are two ways to get there. Your reputation is a combined product of those two factors. And, you know, I've been listening and doing my homework on you. I know you're a big music lover as well. So, you know, when you when you do that kind of analysis, like, yeah, it makes sense, you know. The guy knows music. He's putting it in. And it's almost like being a one-hit wonder. You know, like, you know, you take somebody that just had, like, their only 20-game 
uh, win season, like, say, Fritz Peterson in 1970. And, you know, uh, you can go through his whole career and say, well, he had 19, eight, 19 and 18 wins and 17 wins these years, but it'll always, it'll always be you're a, you're a one-game 20 winner uh, because you're a one-time 20-game winner because that's what we measure greatness by, 20 wins. Mm-hmm. Right. I think a good modern example would be maybe someone like Tim Linscombe, where his role on, say, the 2010 Giants, I think that was, 2010 was when he was still a good and productive pitcher. His productivity fell off after that. But, you know, people following baseball, then they're going to remember that 2010 season, especially someone kind of as outsized of personality while as undersized a pitcher as Linscombe. But in that way, in terms of how this productivity and spotlight interacted, he's kind of a one-season wonder. But enough people will have heard of him. People who follow baseball even a little bit, he was he was someone to watch. People remember Bob Gibson's 1968 very, very, very well, and sometimes kind of have difficulty placing any other of his years sort of dwarfs everything around it. Now, now you know what's you know what's interesting? You make a good point here. You know something I gotta throw I gotta throw something into the woodwork here. Because it's it's so interesting. Uh, I know you listen to my Hank Thomas um uh you know podcast on Walter Johnson and in the podcast I say to Walter I say excuse me, I say to Hank, yeah, I said, you know Walter at the end eased up on um on uh, players, because that was the thing to do in those days. Uh, you would get you would get a bribe to play uh, not your best, so that the team that you're playing is in contention uh, to win the pennant. And Walter eased up. Sam Crawford, you know, said, "Look, uh, Walter would just throw me a ball, and and that would be it. I would hit it for a single, and you know, I would tell him before the game where it's going to be." And do you know, in 1913, he could have had. A 1.10 ERA, and he forfeited by giving up, I think, six or seven runs that day. And so Bob Gibson owns it with 1.12. How do you measure something like that? You know, it, it, it's very tough to do so. Yeah, certainly. From from where I'm coming from, most of what I'm trying to do is establish a baseline for these discussions. You know, we. People talk endlessly about whether someone's overrated or underrated, you know, the legitimacy of various accomplishments for how they want to tweak things. Baseline contention for me is that baseball's narrative explains a whole lot of how we think of greatness, who non-baseball fans have heard of, but after that, really the tweaks are yours. I spent more time in the book describing the particulars of my formulas than think I normally would, but I did that to be as transparent as possible so that readers can tweak whatever they want to tweak, you know, that they can, that they can go, oh, well, I want to consider this other thing here, and may, maybe then things come out a little bit differently. As I say, I, I think in the introduction, if at the end of this book I've given you the concepts and terminology to come back to me and tell me why I'm wrong, then I consider this book a success because... It's at least framed things for you to think about these other things and incorporate them in a way you want to. And you know something? This this gets into the heart of the whole book right here, this formula, your um, spotlight war. Now, even before we get to spotlight war, what is war and why is it so important to say the metrics? War is a single measure of productivity. It's the only real reason I used it in the book because it's kind of quick and dirty and compares across eras well. Um, it's, it's measuring how many wins a player is worth versus what, what's called replacement level, which is basically the guy you could get for free hanging out in AAA. They have, they have some ways of defining how that is. There's some very nerdy arguments beyond my pay grade as to how to define those things. But it's the idea of if we stuck a scrub out there, how much better were you than a scrub in terms of in terms of how much your doubles and your walks or your pitcher strikeouts and all that, how much that contributed to your team 
in the year in the ballpark you were playing in. So that's that's the core of wins above replacement is how much better is the team that you're on because you were on it versus someone picked at random. And let me ask you how did, and you know now you get now you're going from war to spotlight war. What did you add to this formula? Okay, so for for the reputation equals productivity times spotlight, I'm just using war as a as a straight measure of productivity because it's easy to work with, easy to drop in there. Team spotlight, the spotlight part of that equation, is more or less a weighted rank average of where teams stood in in the team momentum rankings of a given year. If you were what I like to call the alpha team all year, the number one team in your league, the team everyone assumes is going to win, the team everyone buys lots of hats and jerseys of, then that's going to raise your spotlight against a team that wasn't in pen contention all year. If you weren't in pen and contention all year, your reputation is just your productivity. I have this, I have that spotlight as just a base of one. What, whatever, whatever people know you for is entirely earned off the back of your productivity. Your team has not magnified, has not inflated your reputation in any way because no magnifying glass was put to your team that year. And so there's, there's this rise and fall of momentum in a given season based on how your team is doing. The Giants came in with a lot this year, and, but they generated no momentum. So they've fallen to the bottom of the – well, kind of the middle of the NL pack while teams like the Brewers and Diamondbacks and Rockies passed them. But there was an intersection in the middle of the season for that. So that's, that's the base of the spotlight multiplier on player performance. But a number of other things can come in as well, uh, the biggest one being playoff upsets. And it took me a while to figure out how to incorporate this. Uh, I kept having to go back to the 69 Mets, who contended for about a month at the end of the season and had been, been a terrible team up to that point. But I think I've figured out how to quantify that, and it's, we watch playoff upsets because we're watching the more famous team lose. People don't know to pay attention to this underdog, but they're already watching the team that's expected to win. So a team that comes in and upsets that, I assign the spotlight of the team they just beat also to the winning team. And we've seen that. Um, it's been a really big deal with the Cubs. Of the last three years, the Cubs are the only team I've got in my records that have upped their spotlight in three straight years by beating teams significantly ahead of them on the chart. They beat the Cardinals in the division series in 2015. They beat the Nationals this year. And and so that playoff success can drive a lot of narrative because people want to keep talking about you in the off season. You're sort of immortalized that way, above and beyond what the regular season did for you. And so those are sort of the things that that inform this spotlight multiplier on productivity, just how much was the magnifying glass of the media applied to your season based on how your team season was. Now, that's very interesting because we moved to the Hall of Fame. you got a whole chapter on it, and, of course, you're doing – you know, the calculations, war versus uh, spotlight war. But here, you've read the same book I did, Jay Jaffe's Jaw System. What's going on with Jay Jaffe and the Jaw System, and how is it relevant here? Uh, Jay Jaffe's Jaws System. And you can, if you go to baseballreference.com, baseball reference is hyphenated, down at the bottom of everybody's player page, you can see how someone ranks at their position in Jaws. And, uh, Jaws, as far as I understand it, is mostly an average of two things. Their career wins above replacement, the player's career war, and their seven-year peak, the most war they accumulated. I think it's in their seven greatest years, but it might be in just a seven-consecutive-year span. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. The point, 
point being that the Hall of Fame, how we think of people for the Hall of Fame is this combination of longevity and peak performance. We've, we've got longevity guys in the Hall of Fame, the guys who get to those round numbers, 3,000 hits, 300 wins. But we also have peak guys. We've got guys like Sandy Koufax in as well. Frank Thomas was a little bit of a peak guy, although he did play for a while. If, if uh, Vladimir Guerrero gets in, it'll probably be off his peak as well. We've got this combination. And so thinking of thinking of Hall of Fame voting, thinking of the perception of greatness as a combination of a couple of factors, that, that went into my concepts a little bit. And, you know, one of the things that you do here is – when you run the numbers between war and spotlight war, and you give some examples, and you, and you uh, I, love, I love how you put Larry Walker and Alan Trammell and Reigns and Edgar Martinez. You know, basically, you know, Larry Walker should be in the uh, Hall of Fame, and Alan Trammell, I believe, as well should be in there. Uh, but they did place the teams that were well spotlighted, except maybe the 84 um, – Tigers, and for uh, Walker, I think it was the 84 Expos and the uh, late 90s uh, Rockies. But still, these guys, their numbers get inflated when you do your calculations opposed to just war itself. Yeah, one of the things that I like to do in looking at Hall of Fame arguments is look at the percentile rankings of different players on their wins above replacement, on just their their kind of raw productivity, and then in their spotlight war, kind of this combination of productivity and spotlight, this this hybrid measure of kind of their productivity along with the aura of greatness. You know, one of, one of the things that I think is really important to understand about how how baseball retells its stories is that a lot of them come from success. We we have loads of stats and we have loads of numbers, but the story is what gives them their ultimate context. And for guys like Larry Walker, where the most visible teams he was on, their stories were cut short by the strike. His main playoff team was the 95 Rockies. They lost 18 games off their schedule and went quietly in the first ever division series. The 94 Expos were an ascendant team that had their time in the spotlight cut short by the strike. They didn't have a chance to face all these teams in the playoffs and have an upset the way the 69 Mets did. You know, imagine if the 69 Mets had been rising against the Cubs but didn't get a chance to face anyone in the playoffs. That's what kind of happened to the 94 Expos. And so Larry Walker's story just isn't retold as much as other guys of his era. He's he's above average for uh, war if he were in the Hall of Fame. If you're just looking at productivity, he'd be in that sense of credit to the Hall of Fame. He'd be above average there. But I believe he's around 25th percentile in spotlight war among existing existing Hall of Famers that the writers voted in. So I think when they're looking at his his stat sheet, when they're looking basically at his resume, people just can't attack as many memories to him as they can to some of his contemporaries. And that hurts. There's there's no context for his statistics. They're just kind of there on the page. And I, I think that has hurt Larry Walker a lot. In terms of the 84 Tigers, that's a pretty interesting case to me. The 84 Tigers and the 2001 Mariners suffer a little bit from not having been as much of a big deal in the in the years before compared to more visible teams. And to top it off, the Tigers vanquished kind of a in, – in the scale of World Series opponents, they, they vanquished a kind of weaker foe in the Padres, a team that wasn't expected to do well. I even know this a little bit because when I was a kid, I picked up a book from a thrift store. It was a 1983 off-season book that was predictions for the 84 season. And the last line of the Padres write-up said, Patience, San Diego, your time will come, but not in 84. And 
that's always just fascinating because that's when their time did come. But the Padres were a bit of a surprise team if you think about the 1983 offseason. The Tigers just kind of waltzed through some weak competition, get, didn't get to face the juggernauts for which beating them would have raised their reputation. So they, they come off a little bit worse than someone like the 69 Mets who came in with nothing but beat the powerhouse Orioles. Who, who you beat on the way to the playoffs makes a, and then in the playoffs makes a really big difference into how much people were watching you and how much people remember you. And unfortunately, the 84 Tigers suffer in that way. It would have been a lot better. And this, this is a little bit out, this is outside what the, uh, what the stats can measure. But I did find a pretty clear effect out of Chicago that their favorite sons get in the Hall of Fame, kind of regardless of how much their teams won. I think part of that is just having WGN around as a national network. If the Cubs had won that league championship series, if they had gone to the World Series instead of the Padres and the Tigers had beaten them, I think the 84 Tigers would be a lot better known today. And, and you're absolutely right, but let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I remember the 84, uh, oh, my God, I remember the 84 Tigers. The Yankees were halfway decent, as I recall, in that year. Uh, I think they were coached by Yogi know, Berra, and the biggest surprise was the uh, Padres, like you mentioned, over the Cubs in the National League players. But let me ask you this. For a threshold number, for war and for spotlight war, what would be the threshold for a really, really, really good player and a player that's going to go into the Hall of Fame? Ah, uh, Well, kind of the average career war that's in the Hall of Fame, I believe, is around 60. But for spotlight war, that number is closer to 90, kind of 90 or 100. 100 is kind of nearly automatic entry to the Hall of Fame in terms of spotlight war. I didn't calibrate it so that 100 is that. It just happened to be that. The median Hall of Famer that's selected by the writers, their spotlight war is around 27% higher than their war. That median is about where Dennis Eckersley finds himself because he had, he had a lot of productive years as a starter. He came up for Cleveland for a team that didn't do anything. So, when people remember his Hall of Fame case, it's not as an Indian, even though that is a fair amount of his career numbers. He had a lot of high-profile seasons as a starter in Boston. His career kind of tailed off a little bit in productivity and, and with his teams. But then he comes back as, you know, a high-profile, I guess the highest-profile reliever on the dominant 88 through 90 A's, well, 80 through 92, because they were still around, they were still a force up, up until the 93 season we've already discussed. And so that, that's about kind of the arc of a lot of players' careers in terms of how their productivity syncs up with their team's fame. Dennis Eckersley has a few years with the Red Sox, a few years with the A's that everyone remembers, and then a lot of anonymous years kind of on either end of it. Not everyone gets to be a Yogi Berra and spend their entire career in a massive spotlight. And on the other hand, not everyone is Larry Walker and spending their time on teams that people have a hard time placing memories on. And, you know, you give a great, you give a great comparison in your book. And, you know, I live up in Boston, so I'm around the Red Sox all the time. I came from New York. But you, 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 this was probably one of my, the most eye-opening things, Jim Rice and Dwight Evans. It's like Rice is in the Hall of Fame, but Evans' war and spotlight war are much higher. Yeah, this was, uh, if you ever read the work of Jeff Young, he did a Padres blog called Ducks and Orcs. He's written for Baseball Prospectus and uh, several other places. He, he asked about Dwight Evans and Jim Rice, and so I started crunching the numbers and went, well, hang on. We actually get an explanation of some of the reputations here. But long story short, Jim Rice's productivity, the years he was good versus the years he was hurt or the years he had a down year or whatever, 
they synced very, very well with the Red Sox narrative. When he was doing well, so were the Red Sox. Until 1986, Dwight Evans' years were the opposite. A lot of his best years, uh, I think he led the American League in home runs in the strike shortened 1981. He had a really good 1982-1983. But at the start of his career, if you're just going by raw fame totals, fame is just a spotlight war minus war. And so that's kind of measuring just how much the story rem- helps people remember anyone. It's the, it's the reason, for example, my mom can name Babe Ruth as the answer to any baseball trivia question she's asked and not that many more people. But Jim Rice and also Fred Lynn plays a part in this. If you track just their, just their fame through the years, Evans always comes up a little bit behind because he didn't have his really good years until the Red Sox were kind of flagging as a team. Evans' productivity works against the Red Sox narrative. Jim Rice has worked with the narrative. And so even though they were teammates forever, Jim Rice always had that edge on fame, on aura. And, you know, when he was elected, there was a lot of talk about how he was one of the most feared hitters in baseball. That, that aura surrounding his productivity, that spotlight, was a pretty big chunk of, of his Hall of Fame vote. And, you know... Whether that's good or bad, I'm not particularly judging, but it goes a long way to explaining how you could have two teammates right there in the same outfield, and people paid more attention to the one than the other. Let me ask you this question. You go back to 1871, which is pretty much, you know, the birth of uh, of baseball. I mean, record-keeping really didn't come around, uh, a good record-keeping until around 1870. You could find stats... They weren't as uh, produced uh, and as followed as closely as 1878, but you give different points uh, for each, um, you know, each kind of uh, point, point of the game. Like from 1871 to 1968, you get four points. Well, what happens after 1968? And people know that you have to know the championship series. You just don't win a pennant and go to the World Series, and that gets three points. And then in 1994 to the present, well, now you got the division playoffs. Um, you know, the wild card you have here. Why are they labeled with those different points? Because momentum comes from, in my configuration of it, being in first place or being close to first place. Well, what do you do when there are multiple first places? And so what I, how I've configured it is that each first place's impact is diluted slightly because now there's a first place in the East. There's a first place in the West starting in 1969. There, there isn't just one first place overall that everyone's looking at anymore. There are now two first places per league. And now, nowadays there are five playoff spots that people are gunning for. So the individual impact of being so much better than some other team, well, What matters still is that a team is in playoff contention or it isn't. So each individual first place is diluted a little bit compared to, compared to olden times. So I assign fewer points for day of pennant contention because it's that much easier to be in contention now. A pretty decent example of that is this year's Cubs. The Cubs had a really hard time at the beginning of the season. They sort of uh, they, they tread water a bit at the beginning of the season. But they were around just enough to keep gaining some momentum and keep staying afloat, even though they weren't doing that well, but they were still hanging out around first place. So people kept paying attention to them, even though most of what they were paying attention to was their flaws. Right. We were still paying. We were still paying attention to them anyway, and and so first place just means a little bit less in modern times. Pennant contention means less in modern times. We saw the Twins go to the playoffs with eighty six wins. I think is either eighty five or eighty six. Eighty five. That's just not the same. That's just not the same as the as the old days when you needed to get closer to ninety five wins or a hundred wins. You know, definitely in a 
in a in a league before divisions, you know, there are like the 73 Mets as an exception to what I'm talking about division wise, but. The threshold for being in contention, the threshold for gaining momentum is lower now if you're thinking about win totals because there are just so many more teams that are in kind of contention. So the impact that each one gets by being in first is a little bit diluted. Let me ask you this. In the old-time baseball, I, 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 I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. Back then, you had the American League and the National League. How many teams you had in each league? Eight, eight teams, and it was 12 teams eight. in each league. It was eight teams. So let me ask you this. How does a team, I never understood this, I couldn't find information on it, so now one person's going to win the pennant out of the American League or the National League, okay? What was the first tier and the second tier? Like I always see, well, the Yankees finished in the second tier, or the Twins almost got into the first tier. Well, what, what is all that stuff? Do you mean first tier and second tier is how they've kind of been colloquially used? Uh, Well, I've gotten the impression for a long time, just from various reading of old-timey things, that most of what they meant was just, did you place in the top half or the bottom half of the league? That's right. But but I think maybe they meant over 500, maybe as opposed to under 500. But there's also, you know – there can be a really big gap between the teams in third place and fourth place to where really the first tier is three teams versus the second tier of five teams. In 1916, seventh place in the American League was only a game under 500. Second to last was almost a 500 team because the Philadelphia A's were so bad, they were just kind of handing out free wins to everyone whenever they played them. So the, those tiers are kind of a shifting thing, but I think first tier has normally just meant the top half of whatever league or division you're in. And you know what's you know what's also interesting. You even go back to you even go back to the uh, to the dead ball era, and you see that you know in 1919, like I, like I'm finishing my book on Ty Cobb and Trispeka, you know. First place, second place, and third place would get rewarded with a monetary um, stipend, which would be added to your low salary. And pretty much the rest of the uh, league, the rest of the division there, the rest of the uh, uh, conference, that's it. You don't get nothing. How, were you able to go back to those times, see how things worked, and also assign, you know, the kind of uh, number that you would assign to, say, modern uh, ball for the time to play in those eras. Yeah, and one of the things that really came out of that is seeing how important the Tigers were to a lot of storylines. You know, when they they came out of kind of nothing for the first six years of their existence to win three straight pennants, but their first two, they they sneaked in there. It was it was hard fought. They only got it at the very end. The 1908 Tigers won their league by a half game. I think the Indians played one fewer, or the Naps, because Napoleon Lachoy was their manager at the time. They uh they finished a half game back. These weren't these weren't teams that dominated. They they were teams that got there, but they weren't really like the true dominant teams, even though they won three straight. Well, they actually did a lot of pennant contention in the 1910s as well. And just because we know from the benefit of hindsight that they didn't get into any World Series in the 1910s, well, it doesn't affect how they were covered at the time. At the time, they were teams worth paying attention to. So... They got whoever was being productive on them got a lot of coverage, and ten times out of ten, that was Ty Cobb. Secondarily, Sam Crawford, and, but and Bobby Veach and and a couple other sorted hitters. But Ty Cobb was on a lot of contending teams. If things had been broken in divisions, he would have been on some division winners. But instead, he was just on teams that contended strongly. The 1911 Tigers. This is one of my favorite stats of that era. The 1911 Tigers started the season 21 and 2 in, but they didn't win the pennant. They they contended through August, 
but they didn't win the pennant. But they started 21-2. and two. That, is, that is a big deal. The 1915 Tigers won 100 games. They were just, uh, I think they did, yeah, they were just pipped at the end by the Boston Red Sox, who then went on to win their World Series. But Ty Cobb was highly productive in those years. And if, you know, if you're writing about baseball in that era, you're writing about these high-powered Tigers teams, and you're writing about Ty Cobb on them. So even though Ty Cobb spent the last 18 years of his career not going to the World Series, not winning any pennants, he still gets a lot of spotlight because he was on teams that played well, that had some visibility from playing well, and he was productive while they were in that spotlight. And here's and here's an interesting thing as well. I mean that that's an interesting concept. Now, what do we do about split seasons? Nineteen eighty one in nineteen seventy two we had the strike and I think it came down to the pennant where uh, I think Detroit played an extra game and the Red Sox or something like that. Eighteen ninety two. The merging of like the American Association into the uh, National League and stuff. We say there was like two different seasons. You know, can we measure can we measure it in the same aspect as a full season? Uh, I treated those seasons a little bit differently. I don't start tracking momentum until a contending team has played 20 games. The, the main reason for that is because it takes a little bit for each season to take shape. You know, who's, maybe a team sweeps its opening series, but they were playing a team everyone expected to be bad. We we don't know how the season is going to take shape until a little bit in, so I don't start measuring momentum for a season until 20 games. The existing rankings before the season are what the day's rankings are for the first 20 games. For split seasons, because split seasons never really seem to work out at all, um, in, in the time when things are split, I just don't assign anyone momentum. The season, the season as a whole is sort of losing momentum. My understanding of the 1892 split season was that it was very unpopular, but in in that in that split, I just restart the momentum 20 games into that second half, and I do that with 1981 as well, because really the season the season had some real problems, and people were losing interest. So that's the closest measurement I can come up with that everyone was losing momentum. The sport was losing momentum. So don't give anyone credit just because they win the first two games of the second half. No, you restart the momentum. You restart what everyone is paying attention to. And there's a there's a built-in lag time to that. There's a delay while everyone's trying to regroup and figure out what matters to this little part of the season. And how about the fact of 1918 where they stopped the season on September 2nd and, of course, World War II? where you had about 80% of the players going overseas to fight the war, all the big shots, Tank Greenberg, Joe DiMaggio, Ted Williams, they were out of baseball for a while. Yeah, that's a that's a trickier one. Thankfully for World War II, um, wins above replacement war measurements do a fair amount of the heavy lifting on, on some of that. Teams had their individual spotlights, but the players individually just tended to be not as productive because they weren't as good. But a lot of what that impacts ultimately in terms of team spotlight is the seasons themselves were more volatile because teams rose and fell precipitously based on whether they had their lineup intact or not. And so... Well, in the end, all that's not nearly as true because the Cardinals had their Branch Rickey made farm system and waltz dependence in 42 and 43 and 44. Then they lose Sam Musial in 1945, and that's finally enough for the Cubs to sneak a pennant in. In the AL, it was just highly volatile. You had the Browns, who never did much of anything. They eked into a pennant. The Senators contended in 1943. They contended uh, at the very end of 1945 as well. Most of what that does for the AL is the Yankees remain the number one team in that league because they just they contended every year instead of contending every other year. 
So to the extent there's a through line, it largely remains with the Yankees in the AL and largely remains with the Cardinals in the NL. But as far as what it does to players' careers, it does interrupt them, like like you're saying, with Hank Greenberg and Joe DiMaggio and, and Bob Feller. I think what people have done in terms of their overall reputation, I think they have kind of filled in those years and assumed a fame, assumed a productivity that would have been given to them in those years, the same way that people have done with the tail end of Sandy Koufax's career. Let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you the last question, and then after I ask the last question, I'll uh, I'll ask you if I left out anything. And I left out a lot because we spoke a lot, but let me ask you this. <laughs> Oh, it's, you have to go on for like the next four hours. You just don't have the time. You got another radio show to do after this. Well, let me ask you this question: A guy like Walter Johnson, he was famous, although the Washington cellar, Senators were cellar dwellers. And now you got a guy like Gil Hodges. The guy between him and Duke Snyder, they were the most popular first baseman center field that duo that hit so many home runs, X amount of home runs. The thing that's stopping, you know, Duke's in the Hall of Fame, but. Where, where's Hodges? You know, is it fair to evaluate these guys with all these modern numbers and just not take a snapshot uh, by what happened back then and say, look, we didn't have this kind of system back then. Maybe they should be in the Hall of Fame. Well, Hodges, Hodges very nearly got into the Hall of Fame. He he had some very close calls in in getting in. And it took Duke Snyder a while, too. My understanding of Duke Snyder's candidacy is that it was well known that because he was the only less, really good left-handed hitter in his lineup, he got to face a lot of right-handers. The 50s teams threw a lot of right-handers at the Dodgers, so they were right-handed heavy, and that gave an advantage to Duke Snyder. It took him a while to get in. It took Pee Wee Reese a long time to get in. I certainly don't get that. As far as as far as that goes, I think with some of these super teams, some of the guys who may have been ranked kind of fifth or sixth on their own team actually do have a hard time getting in because people just kind of look at the people above them and make some rankings. Oh, they're only the fifth or sixth best player on their own team. Well, so what? That doesn't mean they weren't great. And I, I think Andrew Jones is going to suffer a lot from that. Legendary center fielder in his time. One of the best a lot of people had ever seen. But he's behind Chipper Jones. He's behind Maddox and Glavin Smoltz on his own team. I think it's hard. It's going to be hard for people to wrap their minds around that, besides other shortcomings with his resume. I think Gil Hodges is sort of the Andrew Jones of the 50s Dodgers in, in that sense. As far as Walter Johnson... Walter well, Johnson is a really interesting case to me because I have an article on BaseballSpotlight.com it's called, where I award what I call the Zeitgeist Award. If, if you go back to Jay Jaffe's Jaws scores about seven-year peaks, the Zeitgeist Award is just capturing a two-year fame peak. And although Walter Johnson had a very low fame score relative to his award, he has a very high spotlight award because he was so productive. But his productivity is so much his reputation in a way that's also true for Rogers Hornsby and for Larry Walker, and it's less so for Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, who have transcended into more of the pop culture than Walter Johnson has. But Johnson very nearly, he was, I think, 0.1 points off from getting my two-year fame peak Zeitgeist Award for the back-to-back Senators World Series teams. He, he did have his moment in the spotlight, it just came when he was up there in years. There, There is a modern parallel to that, and that's Roy Halladay, who, when, when he got on the Phillies in his latter years, was suddenly a household name, and then only had a couple years and was done after a long time with some obscure Blue Jays teams. So Walter Johnson did have his spot, but that's why it's easier to think of him as an old pitcher than as a younger guy who dominated the 1910s. Let me ask you this question, because you, know, you just jogged my memory. Smokey Joe Wood, 
guy was a fantastic pitcher. 1912, he won 34 games, lost five. I think he had another season, then he blew out his arm. And then he became a utility player, basically, and he had a decent average. How do, you, how do we rate this guy? He goes from a pitcher to an out. It's the same like Babe Ruth. How do we do that? Well, in, in that case, because I'm, I'm certainly not qualified to work on those things too much, I, I used their wins above replacement. I, I factored offensive prowess into war when it made sense, when it was part of the reputation. And it was part of Walter Johnson's in the way that it was also true for Red Ruffing, in the way that it was true for Babe Ruth even while he was a pitcher. As, as far as Smokey Joe Wood's concerned, of course, most of his thing, most of his spotlight comes from that 34 win season for a World Series winning team, which is exactly what you'd expect. What you're describing, I think, is a quirk that can add to someone's uniqueness. And while while my numbers can't capture that, I think it is certainly correct to sort of mentally add some spotlight to players who did something unique, who did something memorable. That that adds to their fame in a way that the that the raw numbers never can. Mark Fidrick is a really good example of that. Yeah. The bird, yeah, of course. You know, he had that one great season, and then all of a sudden he hurt himself, and then what? Right. By the, by the numbers, he was a fantastic pitcher that year on a team. No one was paying attention to the team at all, but he was unique enough that he gave reasons to pay attention to the player in ways that are demonstrably, measurably different than people paying attention to his team. Ken Griffey Jr., another fantastic example there. You know, he was – he played for terrible teams pretty much throughout his career. They're pretty much as bad as Larry Walker's overall, but he was a first draft pick. He was the son of the right fielder on the big red machine. I think that helps a lot. He was he was the headliner of a flagship video game franchise. You know, two, two Ken Griffey Jr. presents Major League Baseball video games. He kind of helped the upper deck baseball card brand become a thing just because his rookie card was in there. All of those measures that the that my stats can't get to, and that's before all the home runs and his personality and and all that. All those other kind of more traditional markers that we're used to in terms of uniqueness add to Griffey's case in a way that my numbers can't measure, and I'm 100% fine with admitting that. But again. I think those things are a lot easier to pick out and understand because we've got some base measurements now of what we would expect the story of baseball to elevate these guys to. Let me ask you this question. Did I forget anything or maybe overlook something that you really want to get out, that you really want to tell the listeners what's important to all this? Uh, Well, I'll, I'll um, I'll go with one comparison you mentioned Dwight Evans, Jim Rice. That's been a popular comparison that people like to use. The other favorite one I like to use from the book is Whitey Ford versus Tim Hudson. Now, <laughs> yeah, that's good. now people don't automatically think Tim Hudson Hall of Famer. Can't can't blame them there. By by wins above replacement, by war, Tim Hudson is about equal with Whitey Ford. And while that may seem weird, Tim Hudson does have a 625 winning percentage. He won 220 games. He lost 133. His ERA was 3.49. That's not a bad ERA in the era he played in. He played in some very high offense eras. And, and he, you know, his winning percentage is over 600. That's very good. If Tim Hudson had been on the 50s Yankees, I think he would be in the Hall of Fame. Number one, he would have more wins than that 222 because he was on better teams. He would have had Mickey Mantle behind him instead of not Mickey Mantle. Wins, RBIs, and those sorts of things, they kind of have a little bit of spotlight measure baked into them because they involve the success of your teammates, which implicates the success of your team. But these sorts of thought exercises are really helpful, I think, in understanding the role of teams and how they help pad players' stats 
by by dropping them into a kind of a more sympathetic context. And so, you know, if you've ever looked at Tim Hudson's career numbers, go take a look at them because they're really surprising and a, and a good – kind of a good barometer of how stats are ultimately important to us because – they help us tell stories. One of the things I mentioned in the book that I think is going to be really useful here, and and then I'll wrap up, is we assign meaning to records based on the people who hold them. That's that's the thing I bring up in the book, that Lou Gehrig's consecutive game streak, we didn't care about it because he took the record from Everett Scott, a no no-hit shortstop of the 1910s and 20s, We care about it because we were going to tell Lou Gehrig's story anyway, and the consecutive game streak adds to that legend. We care about Joe, we care about the hitting streak, consecutive games hitting streak, because it's Joe DiMaggio's. We don't really care about the doubles streak, which has stayed intact, the doubles record, sorry, which has been held for longer. It was held by a guy named Earl Webb from the 1930s, who just did his record and then kind of vanished off the scene. When, when players threaten records held by famous players, they sort of step into that spotlight. Cal Ripken's story gets married to Lou Gehrig's story with his consecutive game streak. Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Barry Bonds, they step into the story of Babe Ruth. Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris did the same thing. Hank Aaron did the same thing. And And again, I think it's just very useful to understand and think about that the records we cherish, the numbers that everyone's keeping for every conceivable thing, possibly too many things, as you were alluding to a little bit on the sabermetric end, there's too many things that don't matter, maybe, that all of this serves just to advance our narrative of baseball. We want to tell the stories of the things that matter to us, and baseball has had numbers forever to help us do that, but the numbers are always secondary to the story and how, it, how we experience it a day at a time going forward rather than looking at the end of the season and going backward. And I think, I think the material in this book and kind of the approach helps restore our understanding of how we experience baseball to closer to what it actually is. And you know some, you're absolutely right. It is a day-to-day thing, because I'll tell you about Ford. Ford could have had a lot more numbers, and he could have had a lot more wins. I mean, he only won 236 games, and he should be a 300-game winner. But Casey Stengel, manager of the Yankees, reserved him for more of Ford's yep. opponents, for Tigers, Indians, and White Sox, who were all contention with the Yankees. During the first the year. Yeah, I mean, it was the first year. And then, you know, Ralph Huck becomes, Huck becomes uh uh, manager in 61. Now Ford is pitching every four days. And because of it, you think of it, he's from 1950 to 1960. I think he was out for three years doing his service. He wins 100 and some games. And then in the 60s, he only pitched, I think, maybe six and a half years. I think he was injured in 1964 for a while. Mel had to carry the team. And he wins another 100 games. So you're talking about a 10 year period, he wins 100. Uh, in the 60s, he wins, I think he's the only pitcher to win 100. Uh, games uh, in two different decades, if I'm not mistaken, and, and yet his numbers don't show anything outstanding. Right, and you know he had to retire a little bit early due to circulation problems in his arm. He resolved he, some of that at the end, was kind of moved to the bullpen as the Yankees were fading. But yeah, you know. I think Ford is remembered a lot more for 1961 because he put all his pro- a lot of his productivity into – he concentrated it into a couple of years. And, again, not to say that he was bad before, but you're right. It was Casey Singles' usage of him that limited his productivity to that extent. And in 61, that was his uh, first 20-game winning season. It was overshadowed by the whole Maris Mantle, uh, you know, going for the Babe Ruth record. Hey, I had a great time with you, Brian, and I hope you had a great time here today. Oh, it was fantastic. You know, hang on, to, hang on to the line. I'm going to end the show, and then I'll speak to you about it for a minute, uh, so you know, your feedback and so all that. But folks, go out and get this book, Playing for a Winner. Where can we find it, Brian? 
Uh, you can find it um, through McFarland Publishing. You can find it on Amazon. It is it is available as an ebook, but not not through Kindle because Kindle doesn't format books like this very well. It is available for Google e-readers, a Google Playbook, if you just want to get the digital version. I've looked at it. They just do scanned pages of the book. So that's a nice, cheap way to pick it up. But yeah, Amazon's got it. Barnes & Noble's got it. McFarland Publishing directly has it. And you can usually ask, uh, if you have a favorite independent bookstore, uh, they can usually get it for you, too. I've had good experiences with that uh, around Seattle. Well, that's fantastic. Folks, go out, get this book. You like stats. You like sitting in a bar saying, what if Jeter was on Houston or if uh, Ted Williams was on the Yankees? You know, the whole thing with Spotlight War, a very interesting concept. I'm sure that the popularity of this book is going to grow, as does Major League Baseball in the future, because every time I'm looking in the stats section, now I look in the paper and I see difference. There was never a difference. Go out, get this book. It's a cutting-edge book. As always, I'm Ian Kahanowitz, signing off from the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. Thank you, Brandon. And in the immortal words of Edward R. Murrow, good night, folks. Good luck. We'll see you next time.